All right, I believe we are live. Uh, I am talking with Sonia Azam. She is an ex-Muslim who was born into a Muslim family and came to know Christ as a young adult. Uh, but her conversion was not without cost, as her family reacted quite harshly. Uh, she's now been a Christian for a number of years, and she recently started a YouTube channel to share her faith about eight months ago. The channel focuses on outreach to Muslims and on biblical prophecy. It's off to a very fast start, and Sonia's testimony video has nearly 125,000 views. Uh, clearly, people are responding to her story. A link to her channel can be found in the video description. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Sonia. Thank you for inviting me, Brother Thedis, and um, yes, yeah, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to open us with a word of prayer. Uh, dear God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, we ask that any Muslims listening today will be open to hearing what we have to say and that you will work in their hearts to bring them to Christ as well. Amen. Amen. So why don't we start at the beginning. Uh, you were born into a Muslim family of Pakistani descent. Uh, what was it like growing up in that environment? Um, so yeah, being British, being British born, very much, um, I guess I was going to say normal, but I don't know what normal means. Um, it's in a sense, it was very much a loving home. Um, so I'd be sort of a child of the 80s. So we had a lot of 80s music going around and it was very much pretty much normal um, religious wise again in the Muslim family we learned and taught how to read the Quran at a young age Arabic from my dad and um, my dad bless his heart you know he tried his best like he does with the rest of my siblings um, but school life, yeah, pretty much normal, normal upbringing, very loving home. And um, we've got very, very fond memories of that. Uh, very good. So when did you first start becoming interested in Jesus? Oh, yeah. It's when I started to read the Quran in English, when I had the opportunity to ask my dad. Because as a Muslim, we learn the Quran and read it in the Arabic without any sort of comprehension of what it is we're reading. Which is why memorizing verses from the Quran is very easy because it's it's um, rhythmic, if you like. It's something that you do in Arabic. But actually to understand what it is you're reading, you don't have that understanding until, of course, you get a translation in your own language. So I did that. My dad had a copy in English. It was just one of those split. Quran, so it was Arabic and English. So, um, and then I would get in, come across verses regarding Esau. And being British, I was familiar with this Jesus figure, but there was, I did have no understanding regarding why he died on a cross, because that was an image that always is very, it's a strong imagery, isn't it? Him on a cross, and that was about it. But when I began reading, there was verses, not that many about Muhammad, but there was many verses about Jesus or Isa. But now later on, I understand that's not the same person. It's just that understanding, the Islamic understanding is, um, again, it would just lead me to another topic. It's where they steal certain characters from the Bible and is Islamize them, if you like. But my interest began there. And just asking questions, I had no intention of leaving my faith. Um, it never crossed my mind. And I think that's often the case with lots of former Muslims. You know, you just go in your own merry way and then you come across something and, you, and it shocks you, you know. Um, that's how it began, I would mm -hmm. say. And when you were looking at uh, Jesus or Isa in the Quran, and uh, comparing him to what you saw about Muhammad in the Quran, what did you find? It's hard to remember exactly the words now, the Quran, when I try to recollect my memory and think, what was it exactly? But I would say there was this one thing about Jesus. I say Jesus because I know him as the Lord Jesus, but Esau stood out to me. I was fascinated with his miracles. And there was something about him that just, even in the Quran, you see, 
even there, there was something about him that stood out. And it was something that you couldn't, I couldn't just, you know, think, oh, you know, it's something about him in the Quran even where it just talks about him, how he was just a man of miracles. But the thing I couldn't understand was why did he die mm -hmm. the way he did? But again, I was very naive. I would ask my dad. My dad was the first person I would go to ask these questions. And my dad would, you know, say, you're asking a lot of questions, you know. He would say, daughter, you know, these are the questions for the scholars, for the imams. But it's good you're asking. And I was a little nervous even asking him about those things. Because, again, being taught by my dad, I didn't want him to feel that he didn't do enough, you know. He tried mm -hmm. his best to teach us. But this stark contrast between Isa and Muhammad was, was, was huge. So in your testimony, you mentioned that street preachers played an important role in your journey. So tell us more about that. Yeah, street preachers, bless them. <laughs> they, um, <laughs> coincidentally, at the same time, I would say the time when I was seeking God, even though I was a Muslim and you would think, well, she's already worshipping she worships God. I would come across street preachers who would hand out tracts in the streets. And this time I started to receive them and just, you know, tuck them away. And there were other times where I'd catch a train or a bus and there'd be a tract on my seat. Because they do this, don't they? They, they scatter their tracts sometimes. Now, some of them were Jehovah's Witness tracks. Some of them were Christian tracks, when I remember now. And I wish I had them today. I wish I had them. I started to collect these because they had a little scripture in them. And I just thought, oh, maybe I could. I just thought I'm doing my own little research. You know, this is investigative stuff about how, how else am I going to find out? I don't want to talk to any mom. <laughs> I have no intention of becoming a Christian. Again, it was far from my, you know, I had no idea where my journey was going to lead me. But these tracks that these street preachers would give out very faithfully, they had no idea the impact they had on my life, you know. Mm -hmm. So I kept them. And I, the only time I was able to really read them would be at night when everyone was asleep. Um, and then I'd think, oh, okay, so he died for the sins of the world. Oh. Hmm. So you're starting to learn about Christian theology from these tracts. Uh, you noticed that your prayers began to change. How so? Well, this is the prayers were becoming more again to Allah. But the thing is, when I was seeking God, let's say, this reminds me of Nabil Qureshi's journey in a way, <laughs> seeking Allah, finding Jesus. It was I would just want to know more, help me to understand. And I was just dreading asking these, asking God for these prayers to be answered because it was like, I felt like I was daring to do something I should really do. My dad had told me, no, you need to go to the imams. But I'm like, yeah, that's really going to happen, isn't it, Dad? I'll just ask God. And, and you see, the Lord is really good like that. He's so merciful. He's just looking for a sincere seeker sincerely you know like a child just want to know the truth and so when these tracks came my way i was able to read some of the gospel um especially from john and i just thought okay i'm trying to compare these tracks to what i would read in the quran but i was still drawn to him and eventually this is what happened eventually to cut a long story short a very long story I started to believe what I was reading without the Bible because the scriptures were in these tracks and <laughs> I did, I did to do it. And I thought, you know what, this is going to be fine. No one needs to know. I th I'm really drawn to him. I trust him. You know, I trust his Jesus because the tracks are saying he resurrected. So I was fascinated with that. He's alive. Oh, my goodness, this man is alive. Excellent. And where there were verses about him being like the spirit of God, I just saw him. This is a terrifying thought, but I saw him as God. 
And I thought I was safe with him. I can be safe with him. And then I, I prayed. I prayed alone in my room. I prayed to the Heavenly Father. Because I thought, that's just the way Christians do it. I'm just going to copy them. There's no harm done, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely fine to do it. It's very naive, you know. <laughs> but it didn't stay a secret for long. Uh, very good. So you made that crucial commitment to uh, Jesus. Uh, I believe in your testimony you said it was kind of late night, middle of the night type deal. And you thought you could keep it secret for a while. Um, so obviously you didn't go on to tell your parents right away. Uh, so moving your story forward a bit, you were uh, working at a government office, I believe. And one day while you were on your lunch break, some Colombian Christians came in. And this would prove to be an important encounter for you. Tell us more about that. Yeah, that was in uh, June, June the 2nd. And it was Saturday morning, afternoon. And it was during the general elections. And what had happened was that there was a lunch period where we had um, lunch break and I was walking around. It was actually East Ham Town Hall. So if anyone's listening from London, it's, um, the location is East Ham Town Hall. <laughs> it's a landmark in our area back home in London. <laughs> I'm just laughing thinking about it now. I went past one of the main halls and in the main hall, was this commotion, music, celebration. And I was being nosy. So I peeped in and it seemed as though they were either in, in the middle of just um, singing and they had finished singing, but there was a lot of, it was jubilant atmosphere. So I went in and, and I learned that they were speaking to me in Spanish. And I said, I'm on my lunch break. Can I come, you know, this is really, cause I'm a quite curious person. <laughs> They welcomed me inside. I stayed a little longer and I realized it's actually a Christian gathering. And they handed out some um, bookmarks, if you like, bookmarks. And I kept one. I still have it. It's here somewhere. And they asked if I had a Bible. I didn't have a Bible because all this time, that was one thing I didn't have. And I longed for the Bible. But there was no way I was going to dare to go out and try to get a Bible. I, I didn't want that to you know, be so obvious, you know, but mm -hmm. they offered it to me and I grabbed it and I kept that Bible. I was so glad because it was very small. I still use it today. It's a very small Bible. And apparently you can't get these kind of Bibles anymore. They're very, they're the slim sort of style. And it was one of the girls there who gave it to me. Her name is Jackie. She had written her name in this Bible, bless her heart. So I got this Bible, they did an altar call, and that was the first time I openly like, sh expressed my faith in Jesus. So I went to the front and I, I did look over my shoulder because I'm in lunch period right now and this is like hometown. But I thought, there's nobody here that knows me, this is fine. I think the Lord is setting this up for me. I think this is it, I have to confess him as Lord. So I did do that and I sobbed for a while on the floor there. <laughs> and I think the people there were realizing there's something more to this girl because she's really crying her eyes out. I wonder, you know, what's her story? I didn't tell them. I didn't want anyone to know, of course, but the Lord had it set up in such a way that I couldn't not do it, you know. <laughs> oh, goodness, I'm so nervous because I remember now the fear that I was feeling afterward. I was very nervous. I'm like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? They're going to find out. How can I keep him a secret? How am I going to keep him a secret? But eventually, um, yeah, my parents did find out about that. Uh, so you now had a Bible that you were given, obviously. You just showed it to us. Um, what did you experience when you began to read the Bible? I started from the beginning. I read from Genesis I was very excited. I was so, um, it's like, uh, oh. When I remember now, I really had childlike faith because I just had read a few snippets of Jesus in these tracts and now I had the actual thing. 
I wanted to go all the way to the beginning. I wanted to know everything about him. So I did. I started in Genesis and I learned about Abraham. And I kept peeping into the New Testament because I know that's where the words of Jesus were in red. <laughs> but I was trying to be very orderly, you see, and I didn't want to skip any chapters. I wanted to know the whole narrative, the whole story. And um, I relished it, but it was just the reading time. I had to sneak around to read it. But I read through the Old Testament pretty quickly now when I think that, you know, when I think about it. There were, when I got to the genealogies, I kind of skipped through them. I didn't understand them. I wasn't very much understanding the kings, the chronicles. So I remember skipping through those, but in in that own actuality, I did read the whole Old Testament, and then I got to the New Testament, and it was so wonderful. It was so amazing. It's like, you know, drum roll, here comes Jesus. <laughs> you know, the love of my soul. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, so you were able to keep your conversion secret for a couple months, um, but then eventually your family did find out. How did that happen? My mama told me that she she basically said she suspects me up to something and it wasn't good. She came across some prayers that I had written to my Heavenly Father, those words, my Heavenly Father, because I didn't know how to express my love to the Lord at that time. It was so much like love inside me that he was giving to me that I was trying to find a, a way to express to him in a creative way. So I would write poetry or like love letters to the father in the name of his son. And it was all very much, you know, when you fall in love for the first time, you're very excited. You don't know how to express it to this person. But this is God, you know, it was very sacred, very personal. However, my mum found them and she mentioned it to me. And I was in a car ride with her. She had picked me up <clears throat> to take me home. And um, that's when she happened to confront me. So I'm in the front seat with her in the passenger seat. And she's asking me, what's going on with you? Do you not know that we don't call Allah father? He's not our father. Why are you behaving really strange? And I was like, oh. And I was so scared for my mum already that I, I just thought, you know, this could go on a bit longer secret. You know, I don't need them to know. But this is about six months into it, eventually, when they found out. She asked me to, um, you're, no, she said to me, you're not even denying it. I'm asking you, you're not, you're not giving me an answer. And I was like, oh, can we just, you know, t like, I didn't know what to say. And she got so upset that I wasn't denying her suspicions that she started to hit me in the car. So I knew that my mum had known, and she said, I seen it, I seen the Bible in your back. I was like, oh, no. <clears throat> and I, you know, it just happens, it just comes suddenly, I wasn't prepared. And she told me to get out of the car. So she punched me and I was crying. I was like, oh, no, Lord, I didn't want it to be this way. And she said she will tell my dad. So she said to think about it before you come home because I'm going to tell your father. So, yeah, when I eventually got home, my dad is a driving instructor and he, he was, he was, he's, I guess when he asked me, when I got home, I was so scared. He said, your mum's telling me some things, are really crazy things. I want to ask you, is it true? I said, dad, you know, we can talk about it when you come home after your break. And he was like, you know, he wasn't willing to accept it. He was, he thought it was a joke. And I got so nervous. And this is, it starts to get worse after this now, because now my dad knows. And um, yeah, it was time for me to come forward and confess to my family. Uh, so one of the things your parents tried to do is they tried to reconvert you. They tried to bring around uh, a moms and teachers and relatives and whatnot and have them convince you that uh, Islam was true. How did that go? Yeah, not long after that, my relatives came to pay a visit because the word got out. And um, 
at this point, <laughs> my anxiety levels are really going higher and higher because of this, the culture, you see, there's a lot of um, shame and honour in the Islamic cult culture, the community. And um, I was beginning to realise the seriousness for my family about them finding out. You know, in my mind, I thought, you know, I can tell them I revere Jesus very much and, you know, but I knew that when I made that confession, that was it. He's my Lord, he's my God, and that's it. And so when the family were coming, they were asking me, they put me on the hot seat. And again, I was very young in the faith, the baby. I, I didn't have all these theological answers, you know. So I answered to the best of my ability, but I believe it was the Holy Spirit helping me, even in the midst of the um, the attacks, the verbal abuse that they were throwing at, my, at me. I was trying to just be brave, be strong, and just try to figure out how do I talk to them without them getting upset. But there was, it didn't matter what I said, how I said it, you know. And I was telling them, it's God, this is about God, you know, I'm not doing anything bad. I know I've been a rebel. I know I've given you a hard time, but this is real. I'm turning to the Lord and he's true. And I would say, Dad, you said our faith is in the roots of Abraham. And he said, that's not what I meant, you know, that's not. My dad was a very calm, loving individual. My mom was the one who was very, very sort of aggressive towards me. And so she got them worked up, my family and, um, and my siblings are all younger than me. So they were seeing all of this transpire and it was, it was awkward, really awkward. So this went on for a few months and then at a crucial point, uh, basically your parents wanted to kick you out and you said, well, this is it, I gotta leave. So um, what was that night like? It was Christmas Eve. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <clears throat> it was Christmas Eve. And by that point, I've had a lot of relatives come over, visit me, talk to me. And they said things like, I'm a guffard. I'm, they don't say the word apostate, they say guffard or garfid. I will burn in hell. Um, they said that somebody has brainwashed me. There's no way that God is talking to her. God doesn't talk. Who's she talking to? It must be demons. Um, I, I, again, I was responding to them from a place of just honesty, like telling them, you're asking me, I'm just telling you how it happened. I'm no one special. God can talk to you as well. But what happened was my mum and dad kept saying, you know, what you've done is very serious. We can't accept you. We can't just let you just be this way. You have to decide. You're going to follow this path and you have to leave. Or you can renounce this, reject what you've what you've done, and come to your senses because you're not making any sense. Um, my mum called the emergency doctor that Christmas Eve. Because, again, my mum is very hysterical. She's very emotionally um worked up at this point so the emergency doctor came and the report was that i was hearing noise hearing voices talking nonsense was the the report so when the emergency doctor had come christmas eve and i was telling my mom don't call them mom they've got bad things to do it's christmas eve this isn't an emergency please don't waste the doctor's time anyhow he came and i told him exactly what was going on but eventually, towards the end of that night, so it's like 11 o'clock, around about there, my dad is just saying, you know, I can hear him say that she needs to leave. And my mum was saying the same thing. And I'm like, where am I going to go? I can't, where do I, where, what do I do? So I, I decided, okay, this is going to have to be the case. I'll have to get a taxi, go to a friend's, and then decide how long... I, you know, separate myself from the family until they realise, you know, oh, she's she's our daughter, we can't kick her out. I was thinking of these things. But that's when I, I was really asking the Lord to help me to know, do I do this? Do I just leave? Are they forsaking me? Are they rejecting me for you? And then I opened the Word of God and I was sitting on my bed and I just opened the Bible and I read Psalm 27, verse 10. 
And that amazing word of God just spoke to me directly. God was talking to me right there, telling me that if my father and my mother do forsake me, he will take care of me. And I knew he was with me. He knows what's happening. He's, he's talking to me. So how can anyone tell me that this isn't true? Of all the verses in the word of God, I happened to fall on that verse. Psalm 27, verse 10. Read it, friends, if you if you have your Bible with you. And I was crying. My younger sister was in the bedroom, and she was very young. I think she was 11 or 12 at the time. And I was beginning to pack my suitcase in front of her, you know. And then I left a few hours that morning, around 3 or 4, maybe 5 in the morning. The taxi came, and I snuck out. I was so nervous. I'd, I'd never done anything like this before. And I was like, what have I done? A few months after that, I got baptized. <laughs> I found a church eventually, and I got baptized in the church. Yeah, so uh, my next question was along the lines of, um, you, when you left, you did get connected with a local church and then you sought to be baptized. You're very excited about yeah. that. Um, it's going to be a big, great day for you. And then when the day finally arrived, um, something very dramatic happened. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, because I was in hiding. When I left home, basically, <clears throat> I, tried, I tried so hard to keep the peace between my mum and dad and myself because I had a lot to think about. I had their health to consider. My younger siblings, I knew what I had done is obviously caused a big problem in the family now. Everyone's talking about me. But I was trying so hard to love them. I'm thinking, you know, Jesus is love. If I show them how much I love them, maybe they'll see the love, in, the love of God in me and it might win them over. But it, no, it was far from it. It was aggravating them even more, you see. So I would test the waters by visiting home and then it would all go crazy again, lots of arguments and then I would leave. So this happened in the space of three to four months. Now, when April came the following year, 2002, this church that I'd found in the local area, the same place, I asked them to baptize me. And um, it was a Baptist church. And they agreed to do that, but they didn't know the um, the whole story completely. But I, I expressed to them the, the whole thing about what's just happened. And they took me through a couple of weeks training in learning about baptism. And I was so eager. I was like, oh, can we just do it this Sunday? I, you know, I, we can do the, like, I can do the Bible study after. I just had this urgency, you know. Anyhow, the day came. The 14th, I believe it was the 14th of April, was it the 12th, 14th? And that day, my mum found me. She tracked me down. And on that Sunday morning, I was sharing my testimony briefly in the church on the, on the, um, on the lectern thing, on the podium. And I looked across, I saw my mum sitting there with my auntie. And that was it. I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be drama. That kind of ruined the whole baptism moment for me, but it got worse because when my turn came, there was two other ladies, I believe, who were having their baptism on that day. When it was my turn, oh, I was dreading it because I, I know my mom. When it was my turn, Pastor Watts had me in the waters and he was ready to baptize me. My mom came out screaming, shouting, cussing, really like violently she came towards the baptism of waters to stop me she wanted to pull me out i was looking at everyone thinking oh what are they oh, i don't know what to do should we cancel should we do it again i was that fearful you know very much um i was like a pe a people pleaser i was a scapegoat so i was always walking on eggshells with my family you know so i thought this is not gonna this is gonna be bad my mom's going to call my uncles. They're going to cause trouble for the church. 
all these thoughts were going in my head. But at the same time, I was praying because Pastor Watts was, you know, telling me to repeat after him. He knew what was going on. It was right there in front of him. But he he tried to cover my ears so I wouldn't hear that language and just say, just if you can, just listen to my voice. We're going to pray for you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. I baptize you. I was like, yeah. And I was praying. I was crying my eyes out. My mom was hysterical. She was just saying bad things about Jesus, about the church, calling us devils. Um, and I was so sh- shaken up with it, the whole thing. I didn't know my mum would not, like, I thought she would restrain herself being in a church. But she was going crazy, you know. After the baptism, I came up, they took me behind the where the curtains were. And my mum was trying to, they tried to console my mum, the women in the church. Um, She left eventually and she was threatening the church to have the church burned down. That's what I heard from the other people that were there. That's when the family from the church took me in for a few months. Um, Yeah, I think that was pivotal because after that it was a lot of, you know, people want, want you dead what you've done oh yeah yeah in your testimony video you said something along the lines that it was as if your mother was possessed by demons and uh, it's very true kind of see the spirit of islam here that ultimately you know she couldn't restrain herself she she went crazy an otherwise ordinary person going crazy because you know, that that's what Satan will do. He'll do anything to keep you from becoming a Christian. Anything yeah. to keep you away from God. Yeah, it was very, my mind was racing because I, prior to all of this, when I used to learn the word and read it, again, being very young in the faith, I had a lot of time when I left home. So I was learning more. I was learning from a minister who's passed away now, God bless his soul, Derek Prince. So I would learn about, what does um, what are demons and how they manifest? And so when that was happening, I thought that's what's happening to my mum. There's no way she would behave like that in public. You know, this is not. It's like whatever that was in the spirit of Islam. And I thought all this time she never got that crazy. Is that I thought the baptism, you know, there is power in the baptism because it's like you're saying, I'm renouncing that kingdom and God is transferring me from this kingdom of darkness into his light. And of course the devils and the demons are going to go nuts, aren't they? But this, again, you know, my, my account of what's happening, it's not the first time. This is very common. This is why so many ex-Muslims, when they go for baptism, they have to do it in secret because you're declaring openly that you belong to Jesus and you're confessing him as your Lord and they don't like you. Uh, sorry if it looked like I was distracted there. Um, we have some trolls in the chat making trouble, so I was just warning them. Um, and then someone asked if they can ask you questions, and yes, there will be a Q&A after we get through your testimony. Uh, so moving on, after your baptism, uh, you decided to move further away to, from home to prevent any future um, problems. What was it like living far away from home for the first time? Oh, it was, uh, yeah, what it was is that it was, I was receiving a lot of counsel advice from the church. And they said, you know, might be a good idea for you to keep a healthy distance away from the family and from the the Islamic community, the Muslim community, because I couldn't keep on just hiding. If I wanted to go out, I had to hide or disguise myself. It was ridiculous. So um, I moved and I lived away from London for five years. And that time alone, um, I had some friends, had some good Christian friends then. Um, that time really helped me to get a bit more grounded in the Word of God. And to really, I this is the first thing that I thought I'd have to do was get a Quran, understand, you know, you know, respond to all these arguments. And it's really 
amazing that but that is not what the lord had me do i did have a quran i actually smuggled one <laughs> i took it with me because i thought i have to be prepared to give a defense you know and if anyone's asking me i have to study the quran but for a few days, I don't know how long, I was having nightmares and some bad stuff was going on until the Lord had revealed to me, get rid of it. Take it out of this house. That is not your calling right now. Because what I need now, when I look back, I realize I was a baby. I needed to be grounded in the milk of the word first. And so he had me do that for five years until the pressure from my family was really sort of... You know, it's a lot of emotional manipulation, you know. They play on your emotions. They bring in the culture, the shame, the honor. And so I compromised. I To keep their respect, I said, okay, I'll come home. If you would just let me believe in Jesus. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we'll work it out. We'll work something out. We'd rather you be at home because it saves respect. You're not married. You can't live away from home like this. And my, my my bond with my siblings is very strong, you see. And so for for so many reasons, I said, okay, all right, I'll do it. But then I wasn't allowed to go to church. I wasn't allowed to talk about Jesus. They wanted me to be silent about it, you know. So we never talked about God. We never had those discussions. And then what that did to my faith is that it put out the fire, I compromised. I went into employment. I was looking for a career. And I thought, you know, Lord, you know, if you've called me, you will you will do something with my life, Lord. But then I started to, yeah, I compromised. You know, it was so sad. There were times where arguments would flare up again and it would be something else, something. If I was out on a Sunday afternoon, they would all assume I've been to church and find out what church I went to. And it was so much hassle for the whole family, my siblings. It was so much that I thought, well, I have to try to keep the peace. I don't know why I did that. You know, I felt like I was being intimidated, but I can't I can't fight against my parents because you have to respect your parents. I was very torn, you know. Uh, definitely. Um, of course, it, the, I can't imagine that situation. But, you know, on the one hand, you... You want to love your parents. You want to show them the love of God that's within you. On the other hand, they they want nothing to do with uh, what's the most important aspect of your life, your your new Christianity. So it just must have been an impossible situation. Yeah, I really wanted to love them, you know, to do right. And I kept reading the Gospels where Jesus would say all these things that if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Deny yourself, you know, father and mother, if you love them more than me, you're not worthy of me. You know, I would find a lot of comfort in those words. I would still read the word of God because all I had. I wasn't allowed to fellowship. I wasn't allowed to do church. So I didn't even want to sneak around to do that because of the problem it would cause the church. I was trying to people please, you know, trying to take control of the situation which the Lord revealed to me after how much fear of man I had to deal with. But he has also given me this boldness as well, this courage. And it's all him. It's his Holy Spirit. Some of the listeners might be aware of my some of my videos. I can be very, I can come across very strong when I want to speak up for something. But for myself, I, I just, I don't have, I can't speak up for myself but if I see injustice to someone else, then I will speak up strongly. But I understand now why, you know, I was always picked on when I was a little girl. But the, in the Gospels, there's so much in there that the Lord is already, well, he told us this is going to happen, you know. He has told us that this is going to happen. Nothing takes him by surprise. Like in Matthew 10, it says in verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. And that whole chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, is so encouraging. You know, 
when I look back on it now, it's like it's remarkable. He's he's keeping me strong to not ever deny his name. I had still there were occasions where in family um, celebrations there would be like an event in the family, and I was still expected to go and mingle or socialize, keeping Jesus, a, you know, a secret. It's very demeaning, but again, this is coming from the Islamic way of doing things. You know, they do it to communities. They've done it. If you look at how Islam had spread, it expects the Jews and the Christians to submit, to find them superior than the Christians and the Jews, you know. It's just the way, but I didn't know all this at the time. This is afterward, I I would find out. Really demeaning stuff people would say to me, and I would just turn the other cheek. I would turn the other cheek over and over again. It didn't do anything. They never stopped to think, wow, look at the love of God in her. There's something different about her. No. You see, sometimes this turning the other cheek, it does work. But within within the Muslim community, they're so fervent, zealous for what they believe in that when we do this, they mock us. They think it's ridiculous that we haven't got a spine, you know. (laughs) So I tried that as well. I tried it. This This is while I was a compromised believer in Jesus. Can you imagine? I wasn't even Bible believing, bashing them over the head with this is what the word says. I was in a compromised position and still it wasn't good enough for them. They wanted me to be married to Muslim, so I would completely forget about Jesus. Um, it's just their way of keeping it hush hush, you know, because it's so bad, isn't it? It's the worst thing in the world according to Islam. Yeah, difficult situation for sure. Um, At some point, you were given the opportunity to share your testimony anonymously. Um, How did that come about? In the media? Yes. Yeah, I was during, I think it was 2007, around that time, 2006, 2007, Um, because I was working and I was like looking for jobs to do and there was lots of distractions, there were some things I was doing behind the scenes I couldn't tell anyone about. Because remember, when those, when I was living alone for five years, I was getting into the Word of God. The Lord was showing me Bible prophecy, which is why a lot of of my videos are regarding the end times. Now, what happened was, it's so hard to describe this because when you're saying the Lord showed me, how did he show you? You know, I fasted for three days asking the Lord to really help me understand what's going to happen in the end times. I want to know because I'm so looking forward to his return. My motive is, Jesus, when are you coming? When are you coming, Lord? Please, you know, this world is wicked. When are you going to come? So I want to know. I'm looking to his coming. So he would show me certain things. And I would figure out through his help that a lot of these prophecies are regarding this Islamic Khilafah that my dad used to tell me about. And I was like, oh my goodness, the penny dropped. And I remember that I went through about a week of <laughs> grieving. I was so sad with what I'm finding out. Like, this can't, can this be the Mahdi? Oh my Lord. So... With that study and that understanding, I began to think, well, you know, maybe I can help. Maybe I can do something. You know, I need to get the word out. So through contacts, I was um, invited to do a testimony. I shared my testimony on different platforms under an alias. I did um, interviews in the newspapers. I also did some undercover work to find out about this how serious is Islamic extremism in Great Britain. I also, thanks to the Lord's opening doors, I had an opportunity to meet some people in in, um, the political scene. And they would ask me, what drives you? Why are you here? Nobody paid me a penny to do it. I was not paid. I was not sponsored. I had no agenda other than I would go there. Would you believe this, brother? I was in... I was in Parliament having this uh, meeting with this particular politician. I don't know if I should say her name right now because she's not around at the moment. 
in her office and she said to me, what's your solution? Why are you doing this? Because I was warning her about extremism. And if we're not prepared, we're going to see civil war in, in the UK. We need to do something about it. I was asking her to start monitoring all the mosques, get people who understand the language behind the closed doors, that they need to start monitoring these people. And also be careful about the hijab because I fear that you'll have terrorist suicide missions by females because of the identity thing. And she was like, why are you, uh, you know, what's your thing? I said, because I believe that Jesus is returning soon. And if we're not careful, things can get really, really out of control. You have to consider Islam is, is, the, is an ideology and all this stuff. And so people were putting me in touch with other people to talk about these things. And it got so exciting for me as well because I felt like I was doing something useful, you know, that I'm not just, I'm doing something worth, worthwhile. But it was very much leading a double life. It was hard. It was hard to do that. And, and the fear got the better of me. I thought if my parents were to find out, they will kill me. Somebody will have me killed. The imam, two times the imam, the one that my dad had arranged to see me, had already said to me, what, I, what I've done is worthy of that punishment. But they said, because this is Britain, they, they can't do that. What, what is he saying? Because it's not Sharia compliant, that's how I interpret that, you see? Yeah. Like if it was Sharia compliant, then I'm sure they'd have a way of, you know. And that's not fear mongering, that's just the way it is. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like if he had the uh, ability to um, put you to death, he would have. It was only that he knew that he couldn't get away with it, and the UK was holding him back. And that's the only reason. There was no other reason. Yeah. It's a difficult thing to say, you know, because my family is still Muslim. I love my siblings. They know that, um, you know, a lot of time has gone by now, you know. They know that I still believe in the Lord. Um, they're not aware of my, my channel. There is word has been put out that they've discovered my channel out there. So I'm bracing myself, you know. <laughs> So I'm going to um, ask the Lord that he's brought me this far, that he's not finished with me yet, and he will continue to use me. Excellent. Uh, so I, now that the question that I'm sure everyone wants to know is, why did you decide to start a YouTube channel? Oh, you guys, I know. I had no, I had no idea to do it, no intention. What it was, over a year ago, <laughs> I know it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Over a year ago, I started to do Bible studies, like very short videos on my Facebook channel. I mean, Facebook channel on my Facebook page. And I would use the live feature. I would just share my Bible studies, views, opinions on Facebook, because you have an option there to do Facebook Live. And then what would happen was that people would recommend or suggest that I upload those videos to YouTube to save them and put them there as a backup because some videos of mine on Facebook were being removed by Facebook. But I was like, no, 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 not YouTube. That's way too public. My whole family's going to find out. I can't do that because I was still a chicken. <laughs> Let's face it, I was very, very much intimidated, you know, because I don't want to upset my family. You know, I love them so much that I just don't want to upset them. Anyhow, I began to upload some of my videos on YouTube, and not all of my videos are about Islam. I cover various different topics and subjects, whatever I feel the Lord is showing me to talk on or, you know, look into, I, I express it. But it's not even been a year. I haven't been on YouTube very long, you guys. I think it's eight, seven or eight months now. But um, I believe now I'll, I'll just use it as a platform and continue to do what I'm doing. And all those things that I've been studying for the past, what, 17, 18 years, I can share it now. Because I believe time is short. You know, we all have to do what we can and not fear the enemy anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what can he do? Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. Fear him who can destroy both your soul and your body. Cast it in hell. You know, I fear him. 
And even as I'm talking, I'm still trembling, you see. But so <laughs> God uses that, you know, he uses it for his glory because then no one can boast. I can't boast. He gets all the glory for it, you know. Absolutely. As Paul says, uh, my power is perfected in your weakness. Or Amen. as God told Paul, I should say. Uh, so we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, there's been a lively chat. I haven't really been looking at it. Just took a couple of glances to make sure people were behaving all right. So <laughs> if anyone's asked questions, I haven't seen those. So repeat your questions now. Um, I'll start with the first question. Uh, as someone who's had uh, extensive experience in both Islam and Christianity, what would you say the key difference between the two religions is? The key difference. The key difference. <clears throat> Islam is a religion that is um, it's about control. Whereas Christianity or following Jesus is all about the spirit, the Holy Spirit who is leading us and guiding us. Um, when I say control, Islam controls every aspect of your life. How you think, how you dress, what you eat. How you go to the bathroom is ridiculous. It's a system. It's a very totalitarian system. There is no freedom of expression. There's no freedom of um, worship even. You can't, you see, the thing is with the, with Islam, you can't even pray to God in your mother tongue. You have to do it in the Arabic. So there's something about, something sinister about this system where you are becoming Arabized when you become a Muslimah. You'd have many converts to Islam, and what's the first thing they do? They do the Shahada, but it has to be in the Arabic. So Satan has, I would say, is inspired of the enemy, absolutely. It's very much an antichrist system. Um, if we, look, again, look at the history of Islam, we'll find out exactly what it is I'm saying. It's all there. We just have to do the homework, do the research, and it's, it's shocking. It's shocking that we're still having these discussions where, you know, but Islam is a religion of peace, you know. If you have to say that, then there's something wrong with that, you know. Definitely. There's something wrong with that. But the following Jesus and is all about follow me now. I am the one. When um, the in Deuteronomy where it was prophesied, when Moses said, a prophet will come. This is him. He is that prophet. But he's more than a prophet, you see. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, it's remarkable. Of course, I didn't know all this when I first believed in him. You know, it's very much in stages how the Lord starts to disciple us by his Holy Spirit. We can't do it without his Holy Spirit. You know? Excellent. Uh, so... We'll give the first question to Narratives of Old. He's a Muslim who likes to contribute to my channel. He's normally very respectful, so I appreciate his contributions to the, my channel. I, he says he would like to know how you left Islam without understanding anything about Islam. So, so respond to that one however you like, and then I might have a couple words to add to that. I understood the basics, and I think you know, that onus is on you, on the Muslim community, because we're taught from a very young age, that from the age of five, five years old, that we have to memorize Arabic prayers. Now, why is that? Why, are you, why is the Islamic community indoctrinating, brainwashing young children into confessing, memorizing prayers in Arabic? Because they have no understanding. They don't know what they're confessing. They don't know what they're saying, to whom they're saying it until they grow up and they're in their mid-twenties, where by now you should be a very um, educated, very informed person about the religion that you have been brought up in. Now, so why is that? So I would put that question back to you and ask you, why is that? That's very common thing. When people begin to understand what is actually written in the Quranic text, in the English or in the French or whatever country you're from, you're shocked because this information has been purposely hidden from us. Who in their right mind would want to worship a man who claimed all the prophetic scriptures of Deuteronomy, for example, for himself, 
Yet he's the very opposite of those prophecies. He's the false prophet. So I think what Islam could do is to start educating their followers in their own language. So they have their right mind and they're not brainwashed. You see, the true brainwashing is that right there, you see. Uh, definitely. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of Quran verses that say that um, people aren't allowed to doubt anything about Islam. So, and while people may or may not know about those exact verses, they absorb this uh, mentality um, through, you know, their relatives and parents and whatnot, that they really shouldn't ask any questions, that it's just, you know, do what you're told, uh, go to mosque, pray five times a day, et cetera, et cetera. And there's no real intellectual understanding of the religion for the vast majority of Muslims, I would say. When I asked my dad, I asked him again with a lot of trembling. I asked my dad when I was pushed into a corner. There was one of those, you know, occasions where I was being hounded with all these arguments about um, the corrupt, the corruption of the Bible and all these things. They expected me to give them answers like this. I, I didn't know any of this, but I asked my dad. I said, Dad, let me ask you. Why do you bow down and worship a stone? Dad, I'm not a theologian, but Dad, just stop and let's think about this, Dad. Why Why are you doing it? In the Old Testament, that was called idolatry, and that same God doesn't like you. He's still bowing down to another idol. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And my dad got so angry, but he didn't give me an, an answer. He said, well, you're asking questions, only the scholars. I said, Dad, you should know. I'm asking you. When you're on your... When you're doing namaz, when you're on the prayer map, what image is on that map? Dad, you're worshipping a rock. Think about it, Dad. And he, and I would get in trouble for saying that. But it, it does go to show my dad, as much as I love him, he was not able to respond to me. Although there are many clerics out there who are very quick, you know, with the response. They'll say, we're not worshipping a stone when they are worshipping a stone. It's like with Muhammad and what he did with women. He didn't abuse women when he was abusing women. It's cognitive dissonance on a level I have never seen. Well put. Um, there's a lot of things in Islam that if they were in any other religion, and even if the adherents of said religion denied that they were polytheistic or pagan or however you want to put it, the Muslim would say, yeah, but you're actions speak a lot louder than your words, but then the same exact things in Islam, somehow it's pure monotheism. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is, according to Islam, everyone's uh, born a Muslim. So, you know, you got billions of people leaving Islam without any understanding of it. So I don't know yeah. where, where the confusion comes from. <laughs> so and even so, you have clerics who, or, you know, I can't think of them on top of my head. There are many former Muslims, even, you know, people in Hezbollah that know the book. They know the doctrine. They understand jihad. They leave Islam and they say, no, 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 this is wrong. This is wrong. I've seen it. I've lived it. I've breathed it. So, you know, this this is, you see, with Islam, the spirit, and again, notice we're talking about Islam. We're not talking about Muslims. There are very, there are many peaceful Muslims, but Islam isn't peaceful. So, you know, we're talking about that, but what they do, they divert the attention to say, you're, it's you, you didn't understand the text. Now you're bashing and tainting all Muslims at the same. No, we're not. We're not doing that at all. We're, that is not, that's very far from the truth. We're actually doing you a favor, a service in the sense that you're, the believers who are doing these things, these rituals, they're not, are you aware of what you're doing? Stop and think about it. The very commandments that was, that were given to Moses, you're breaking them. Well, how is that? How is Muhammad that same prophet? He's the lawless one, the very one who broke all of them. You know, they don't even know what the commandments were for. You see. Mm -hmm. So the next question is a personal question. So if you don't want to answer it, just say, just decline to answer it and we'll move on. Uh, Migusta says, uh, do you have a family on your own now? Or are you alone? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. I'm living in California now, but I'm I'm in a good place. I'm safe. 
Excellent. Um, so Muhammad Amin, he's kind of a troll, but we'll let him have a question anyway. He says, is Jesus a God of love? Jesus Christ is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's also mentioned in the book of Revelation. Yes, he is the epitome of love. That love is not like the love that we understand. You and I could sort of understand it in a worldly sense. He's also, um, let's put it this way, when the Lord returns, he doesn't come as the suffering servant, but he is the God of love. When he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he is God. He's declaring that I am God, I am love. You see, we don't know what love is outside of him. You know, that kind of love is the real love. It takes love like that to die, lay your life down, knowing who you are, yet doing that for your own. He's the shepherd. He's always seeking. He's lost shepherd. When you consider Jesus being the shepherd, there is no other description that displays that kind of love more perfectly, that is willing to go after that one lost sheep leaves the 99 behind that is love only love does that you know but he's also a god of justice righteousness and holiness and when he returns we're going to see that side to him very well a glorious put. day that will be very well put uh so the next question comes from villainous ssb uh he asks you to tell us how Muslims are blessed in paradise, presumably according to the Quran or the Hadith. Oh, that's another thing. It's the shambles, isn't it? It's like whatever is haram on earth is suddenly halal when you die. It's, it's the, it's, I can't even consider the afterlife in Islam seriously. I cannot consider it seriously. It's that embarrassing. Good answer. <laughs> um, let's see. Here's a good one. Uh, how can a meteor forgive sins? Can you tell us? <laughs> of course, referring to the black stone. Yeah. You see, they, they always accuse us of doing the very things that they are guilty of themselves. However, there is a, a beautiful truth in the um, biblical text. That is, you know, like it is with many false religions, they pervert it, you see. Even Paul had, I think it was St. Paul that confronted this Diana, the stone that fell from heaven that was worshipped in Ephesus, which is Turkey today. It's the same thing. It's just got a different name. They would chant out Diana the Great and fall down and prostrate before this thing. They're doing it today. You know, I pray that the Muslims who are listening, that you'd really... Um, really consider these things objectively if not spiritually the lord will help you with the rest you know they go on about god is one yes he is one he always has been but satan is one as well what's that that doesn't that's not an argument is it it's the truth look into the text read them in your own language there's a lot of help available now online you can um, put out your questions do your research, do your homework. Yeah, this a black stone that was once white is just what is that? It's fable, isn't it? It's not true. Uh, Sayed F has a question um, How can I trust in a God who forsakes his son? He adds for his blood, but we'll ignore that part since it was not done for blood. So, how can you trust in a God who forsakes his son? There was a purpose for that, you see. There's there's a purpose. You see, in, in Islam, this is the this is what they did, this is the catch twenty two of Islam. They will say that Muhammad when he came, he's a part of the whole line of prophets. But yet their very beliefs, their doctrine opposes all the crucial I would like to ask Saeed, what does sacrifice mean? When, a, when you commemorate Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, although you say it's Ishmael, what is the point? What's the purpose of it? What is sacrifice? What does it mean? What does atonement mean? You see, when Muslims, not all of them, 
when the radicals or the jihadists blow themselves up, they are doing their God a service by doing that. They not only kill themselves, but they're taking other lives with them. Now, in some sects of Islam, brother, you might know more about this than me, they consider that to be um, a very great service for Allah and, the, and their prophet because they are able to intercede for up to 70 members of their household. So, you know, let's not deflect. When you consider the work of the cross, what actually took place there, it's very much the fulfillment of what Abraham saw. You know, you take the, our prophets of the Bible and you plonk them in Arabia without any history. And even that history is a false narrative because now we understand that Islam actually came from Petra. So the whole history behind Islam is wrong. But the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is historical fact. It happened. It took place. But you won't find answers outside of the Bible for it. It's all in the word of God what sacrifice really means. Even Satanists know about blood sacrifice, you see. They pervert what God had instituted for good, and they pervert it. Excellent. Uh, this isn't a question, just a comment from Jesus is the way. He says, uh, can you tell Sonia I love her laugh? It is so funny and humble. Like Jesus said, unless you come as a little child, you shall be, you shall in no way enter into heaven. So I thought that was a great comment. Just wanted to share that. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Uh, so Muhammad Amin has what he thinks is a trick question here. Uh, he says, is Abraham a Christian or a Muslim? Please answer. I believe he was the follower of the Lord, and it's a trick question. He's definitely not a Muslim. I don't think there's a trick in that, really. <laughs> They'll say, oh, that he bowed down, and Jesus bowed down, that it were, therefore it was, oh. First of all, they don't believe the Bible. They say it's corrupted, which is not the testimony of the Quran. The Quran never says the Bible was corrupted. I believe what they are saying is that it was corrupted by the followers through their words. It wasn't actually written as though it was a corrupted book. But Jesus, Abraham, when God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that, that's his name forever. That's his eternal memorial, you know. There's a truth in that. He's saying, I am his God. I'm the God of Isaac and Jacob. He's the one that they met. Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> yes. And of course, the he, he didn't say it was a trick. I called it a trick question. It's oh, a trick. okay, yeah. <laughs> the trick was that he was giving you only two options, that he either was a Christian or he was a Muslim. Well, he was a Jew. I mean, let's be real here. In fact, he was the first Jew. Um, well, I guess he was saying, you know, well, he's obviously not a Christian because... He didn't follow Christ, and that may only leaves the, that he's a Muslim. I, I guess that's probably where he was trying to go with that. Yeah, Abraham was from Iraq, right, from Ur of the Chaldeans. He must have been a Gentile that God had called out and told him, get up, I'm going to take you to a place, I'm going to bless you. And that amazing faith of Abraham, this is what I would love Muslims to consider. The true faith of Abraham was that he believed God and followed him. He didn't have to do certain rituals. He never needed to build a shrine. He obeyed the voice of the Lord and he followed him so much so he left everything he knew behind and followed this voice he heard. He also obeyed the voice of the Lord when he offered up his only son. You see, that is the faith of Abraham. We walk by faith now, not by sight. This is the remarkable covenant that he made with Abraham. Because of that faith, we can all come into this beautiful covenant now. The father of faith, right, Abraham? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, through the, through the seed of Abraham, all nations will be blessed. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for your wisdom. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's another question from Muhammad. He says, what in the Bible made you a Christian? I don't know if he's trying to play on the Muslim argument that the word Christian isn't in the Bible or something else, but why don't you just answer it this way? How does one become a Christian? Um, 
I would say if you're seeking the truth, again, some some guy out there made a video regarding my testimony saying that, oh, she was seeking God, yet she was a Muslim. It just shows she's a fake. Oh, um, that's the logic behind a lot of these questions. But I would say if you're seeking truth, truth, I... Truth is a person, it's him, Jesus. He said, I am the way. If you're seeking the right way, you're seeking a person. If you're seeking the truth, you are seeking a person, he's God. If you're seeking life, because let's face it, we're surrounded by death and destruction. The life is the person. He's the embodiment of the way, the truth, and the life. So when you're doing that, he knows your heart. He knows your motives. Think about it this way. The same God who knew the motives, the intents of the heart of Pharaoh, knowing how hard-hearted Pharaoh was, God knew that. If there was a way for Pharaoh to be saved, don't you think God would have made a way? But you see, it's the motives. God is very aware of what's going on in here. And if you are sincerely seeking him, you will find him. I guarantee you, he is a faithful God. He is very quick to respond to a sincere heart. He is very good. He doesn't delay. He sent his only son to die for the world. Why would he delay? He's very quick. But you have to, um, he's done everything he can for us. Now we have to take the first step. Or let's say he took the first step. Now we take the second step. We have to acknowledge that there is no other way out of this. He is the way. <laughs> It's the person, you know. So I don't talk about Christianity. I'm talking about a person, Jesus Christ. The, he's also the Holy One of Israel. He has many titles, you know. He's a king. He's a shepherd. He's the prophet. He's the Holy One. He's, he's, he's There's no one like him, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a couple of requests. Heard the cat in the background. Had a couple of requests. Meow. To see it, so. Hello, there she gorgeous. Is. This my, is Abby. My Fifi's still sleeping. She could have said hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, L. Ron Hubbard asks, uh, "What did you think when you found out about a lot, Aluza and Manat?" You know, as a Muslim, I didn't even know about that. You see, because again, we're indoctrinated, aren't we? We're brainwashed. We have to do as we're told, believe what we believe. When I did come across this, I thought, wow, what hypocrisy. They go on about how God can't have a son, yet they, he's got three daughters. And not only that, I found out they were worshipped in Petra. Very true. And of course... Uh... That would also be the satanic versus incident where Muhammad was basically desperate to get some more followers. So he said, oh, you know, those three pegging goddesses that I told you to were false. Uh, my bad. They're actually real. They are oh, exalted yeah. cranes that can bring their prayers up to Allah. So it's OK if you pray to them. And then he got some flack for that. So then. A little while later, he's like, uh, never mind. Satan tricked me into revealing that. That wasn't real. I, I can't tell the difference between Satan and Gabriel. When indeed you yeah. can't. <laughs> it's, really it's really embarrassing. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so here's a good question from Inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Didat. He says, uh, what does Christianity have to offer that lacks in Islam? Life. Um... You see, there's this thing regarding eternal life. We're all created as eternal beings. Now, we know we're not going to live here in this tent or this body, this shell, forever, are we? we? You see, the good thing is Muslims do have this understanding. They have this understanding of the resurrection, this eternal you know, life that we have. But unfortunately, it's misplaced because... All they're going to get when they die is going to get these virgins, a lot of wine, a lot of chilling out, relaxing. There's no concept of what kingdom is. We are all in this world as um, in the kingdom of darkness. It's a kingdom. And Jesus is a king, you see. So 
this is a, a very um, foreign concept for Muslims. They don't understand what a kingdom is, even though when it comes to Islamic eschatology, they consider the Mahdi coming to set up a form of kingdom on earth. You see, it's a very earthly, physical, carnal thinking in Islam where they don't think of heavenly things, although they think they do, but it's not. It's, in fact, very carnal. I don't even know if I responded to that question. <laughs> I went off there on something else. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, and I would like to add that this is what I tell all people, whether they're Muslim or atheist or whatever, when they when they try to say Christianity is just the same as any other religion. Uh, I say that basically every religious system on earth, they you know, of course they have different beliefs, but fundamentally it comes down to the same proposition that you do certain things and you're better off for it. That it's all on you to make the difference. If you try hard enough, you'll be a good person. If you try hard enough, you'll get reward. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Christianity is fun fundamentally different in that we place all our trust on uh, Jesus, God incarnate, and what he did for us on the cross. We don't try to we try to be better people, but we don't try to be better people because we'll get some reward out of it. We try to be better people because it honors God when we do so. Uh, we know that we are hopeless sinners and that there's nothing we could do to be holy compared to God. I mean, God's like, you know, way up there, a million miles away, metaphorically speaking, that he's yeah. so good that we could never possibly um, compare at all. So, you know, you look at the best person on earth and they've done many great things in the eyes of humans, but in the eyes of God, they're still far short of his holiness. So how do you bridge mm -hmm. that gap? And the only way you can bridge that gap is through God imputing his own righteousness onto us uh, through Jesus. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing what he does. He adopts us into his family, into his kingdom. So no one can boast, you know, it's just an undeserved grace, you know. Everyone without the Lord Jesus, they're already under this condemnation that Jesus spoke about. So it's not like he came to condemn anyone, he didn't. We already are under condemnation. He comes to give us the way out. Why would we not accept the way out? What, what makes us think we have a better idea? Who's got a better idea? No one does. Not the government not the leaders of this world they've got they haven't got the better idea the whole world is a mess without the lord and so we have to be prepared for his kingdom this is a kingdom mindset you know he's coming <laughs> he's gonna rule and reign in jerusalem <laughs> i'm so excited absolutely so this one's not a question but mojo dude would like you to know that he really admires your bravery thank you praise the lord Yes, yeah, it's, it's lunacy, and if you think about it, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're crazy for a good reason. It's a good thing, you know. God chooses the foolish things of this world, you see. That's what, you know, we've got no credentials. <laughs> oh, I'm still nervous as I talk, you see. It's like I sound as though I'm bold, but inwardly I'm trembling. <laughs> Did I just say that? Uh you're doing excellent. Uh, I think that the love of God really shines through you. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of unrelated chatter in the chat, so I'm trying to find just the questions. Or this has been really good. I'm not, I'm not used to questions and answers. <laughs> I've never done it. I've never done it before. It's not bad. It's okay. Uh, you just see. don't know what you're going to get next. You're like, <laughs> I didn't have time to think about that. But it's all good. Uh, let's see. I'm not really seeing any more questions. Um, if I missed some, I, which I probably did, I apologize. You can go ahead and re-ask those, but I will ask you a question that if no one else has any, we, we can end on. And that question... Um, so let's say that there are some people out there who are 
uh, open to the message of Christianity, that they're considering it, they haven't made a decision one way or another, um, they have some suspicion perhaps that Islam is false or they're in some other belief system and they're not um, completely confident, but they haven't found quite the answers they're looking for in Christianity either. Uh, what advice would you give them? I would, um, if someone is seeking, again, you're seeking a person who's God and not a method, not a system. It's, um, you're seeking God. So to help yourself make it more easy is make a list of questions that you really would like. If you were to see God, what would you ask him? Ask him those questions. Who are you? This world doesn't make sense. Why is there so much wickedness in the world? All those answers you're only going to get in the Bible, friends. Because all these other religions out there, they don't have this explanation of the human heart. The problem of the human heart is wickedness, it's rebellion, it's called sin. And it, it's done so much damage that it took God to come down to fix it. There's no other religion out there on the, in this world that has an answer. So you're seeking a person, that person is God, rather than um, a doctrine or a religion, compare, you know, comparative re religions, I can't even say it, but you know what I mean. Um, and what, how, what's the best way to do it? Ask questions like Lee Strobel did. Lee Strobel was an atheist, wasn't he? He was trying to disprove the resurrection. You know, for some people, those those questions are really important. They really want the answers. The answers are there. We can find them now. Um, again, remember, friends, he knows your heart. He knows your heart. He won't mislead you, you know. You won't gain anything out of this other than eternal life and a lot of love from the Father. This, it's not about what you're going to gain. People say we're, we we have these videos because we're bashing people and because we make a lot of money. You're kidding me, aren't you? <laughs> Jesus Christ gave his life for us. You know, there's no other greater price on my life than that and and yours as well. There's There's no other God out there who's going to do for you what my Lord did for me. It doesn't exist. It's not true. It's a lie. There is no other way. That's why he said, I am the way. It's me. You're looking at it. I'm here. <laughs> he is everything, you guys, you know. And just think, wouldn't it be wonderful when he returns, when he sees us and, you know, he, you want him to look at you and say, oh, my child. You know, let's not get on the wrong side of the Lord Jesus. It's serious, you guys. The Bible is full of prophetic verses regarding what will happen on that day. And I believe, you know, we're getting close to those days and, you know, we have to get our act right, you know, pull up our socks and be prepared. You know, ask the difficult questions, ask them. And there's, you know, and there's no other better way to ask than to ask honestly. And I'm rambling now, I know. <laughs> now, that's good. I, I don't really have anything to add to that. I, just say that uh, Christianity can sustain every honest challenge made of it. Um, I don't think that any other belief system can really stand up to scrutiny. So don't be afraid to, you know, really question your own beliefs, really look for the truth. We should all want the truth. Yes. Uh, there were a couple more questions in chat uh, while we were talking. So uh, Villainous would like SSB would like uh, to know your opinion on how Islam treats women in paradise. I think we kind of touched on that a bit earlier. So if you want to make that more general, uh, just how the Quran's view of women in general. Well, it's the misogynistic system, isn't it? It's very much, um, and it shouldn't be that way. It's in stark contrast to how Jesus behaved and responded to females. Oh my goodness, when I, I wish Muslims would see this. I wish Muslim women out there, you would consider how Jesus responded to women, you know, how he dealt with them, how he treated them, you know, it's just so different. It is a spirit behind Islam. It's very much against, um, not, I wouldn't say out to destroy women, but if the way they treat them, how else can you consider it, you know? 
even the the lawless one who's yet to come, the man of perdition, he's not going to have much respect for women either. So it does seem to strongly suggest that this bad treatment of women is only going to continue within Islam. It's very demoralizing. It's very disrespectful. You know, in the Bible, women do have their position. They do have their place. There is an order. There is a respectable way of how God has set things up. But there's also an equality as well, just as there is no more Jew or Gentile, no male or female. There is a, an equilibrium in the kingdom. But there is on earth, there is an order on earth, you see. But even in is the Islamic heaven, it's a mess. It's, it's very embarrassing. I don't know what else to say about it, though, but I hope that made sense. Nope, that's great. And then uh, inspired by DDOT would like to know, uh, did you leave Islam because it's prescriptive? And then he says, all it knows what's best for us. So did you leave because you didn't like being told what to do is basically what he's saying. No, I wanted to, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to know who is God. What, Even if you look into Islam and ask the important questions, let's say, what's the significance of Abraham offering up Ishmael, even though it was Isaac? If you ask those important questions, it leads you to Jesus. You're just going the long way around it. Because all these things that took place, because again, they steal the um, biblical text and claim it for Islam. They just put a stamp and say, belongs to Islam. All the prophets were Muslim. What about Zechariah, Ezekiel, Obadiah, Amos? What were they teaching? What was it? What was their message? Who is Israel? What's this nation of Israel? Is God just like, what's happened to the tribes? None of it makes sense in Islam. It's just suddenly this Arabian misguided individual appeared and thought, I need myself a kingdom. I've got to somehow convince the Jews and somehow convince of what we need money. So let's put this jizya. We can kill the Jews. We don't need them. Let's keep the Christians. We'll get money from that. It's a sick ideology. And somehow it's got this big. It's because Satan is involved. Absolutely. And I love that's a statement. It's a big statement to make, but there's there's no other way around it, you see. No, I, I agree completely. Um, as the Bible says, white is the path that leads to destruction. So numbers is not a good indication of truth, for sure. Uh, there's a good question here, which is uh, slightly off topic. But uh, so uh, Claudine says, my niece married a Muslim. Uh, how will the in-laws try to convert my side of the family who are not Muslim. So if you have any perspective on that, um, I mean, obviously, if not, it's not like it's that you have first-hand experience. Well, they would most likely, I'm sorry to hear that, though. Um, most likely, they will celebrate her conversion to Islam. You see, it's the other way around when a Muslim leaves Islam and becomes a believer in Jesus, it's very much an, a, a shameful thing. But when Muslims are winning over converts, it's very much celebrated and promoted. So I would see that their dawah will be spreading and they'll use her niece to do it now subtly. But I would really pray and pray for her, but also find out if there's any males involved, because usually a lot of men like to date girls and then convert them to Islam, you see, because it's a part of their mission. It doesn't end there, so um, unless, of course, your niece is very much, no, this is my own personal choice, then I would pray and also research what Stockholm Syndrome is. Stockholm Syndrome is a very real thing within converts, especially from women. Women in the West are converting to Islam, and you think, why would you do that? I don't understand it. But then when you look in deep, like deeper, you find out that they seem to resonate with this, um, these two worlds that Islam has divided, you know, house of Islam, house of war. And they seem to sympathize with their cause for some reason. And I will put it down to Stockholm syndrome. Because if you look at the text, there's nothing in there that is good. And uh, I'll just add that 
Um, obviously, that's an unfortunate situation, but at the same time, if you have a relationship with your niece, that might give you an opportunity to uh, evangelize her, uh, the fiance husband's family. So, you know, look at it two ways. One, one obviously, uh, they may try to bring you into Islam, but at the same time, it's your opportunity to bring them into Christianity. Uh, do one more quick scan of the questions here. I'm sure I probably missed some stuff. It was going way faster than I'm used to. Uh, you brought in a lot of people that more people. That's than really to. good. I can't see anyone's comments. I can't <laughs> read the chat because I'm on my phone. I use my iPhone for these videos. I can't I'm really. I'll, I'll look forward to reading them later. Uh, yeah, the. A lot of back that's good forth. at least you know people are enjoying this discussion that's really good that's really yeah, encouraging a, a really good response please share the video friends and um share it there's lots of questions i know and you know it's hard to remember them isn't it in your life it's hard to remember them um uh, yeah i see a number of things that are phrased as questions but they're really back and forth chat so i think that this would be a good place to end it um do you want to say any last words um i did write a little note here um for like any closing thoughts um or for those muslims who are out there um who are considering you know, the very forbidden thing to do considering Islam and looking at Jesus. I know it's a very fearful thing. You know, you're really going out there and you're, you know, you're stepping out onto the waters. I understand that, you know. But let me tell you, we are very blessed to have many good apologists, polemics out there now within the Christian community. You can ask them questions. They'll answer you honestly without any agenda. And I would say without a bias, too, because we, so many of us have had to look at Islam without a bias. It's been very difficult to do that because we want, we are truth seekers. We seek the truth and we found him, he's Jesus. So I would really encourage you to do that. Ask those dangerous questions, ask them. Um, and also be careful who you ask. Be careful who you ask because a lot of people will discourage you. They'll say you're crazy and you might get in trouble, you know, so be careful. And for those believers who are ex-Muslims in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to really get more um, grounded in the Bible, um, the Word of God, understand the prophecies, the doctrines, they're really important as well, baptism, for example, and those sort of things. Um, and, yeah, I think... I don't know. I think that's, that's it, really. That's, those are the things that I do. I'm doing that for myself. Excellent. Uh, not to put myself out there, but uh, my email is listed in the description box of just about every one of my videos. So if you want to send a private question to me, uh, yeah, that's quite all right. Um, and, uh, I just want to say everyone, regardless of what religion or belief system they belong to, should be interested in seeking truth and my cat is ready to be fed so i think we'll sign <laughs> off here thanks once again for coming on and i hope to do this again sometime yes it's been a pleasure thank you so much thank you lord jesus thank you thank you